but we're getting started back in Mark again, and our intention is to thematically address some uh, major themes in uh, the book of Mark from chapter 8 through chapter 16. Uh, and so we're going to, uh, uh, to not move verse by verse uh, through every chapter and verse, of course. We just simply don't have time for that. But our, our calendar is going to come together with hometowns uh, starting, at, um, um, starting actually the, the Sunday after Easter. Uh, we'll begin preaching through the same stuff throughout the year. And um, so we're going to try to hit some things in Mark thematically throughout that time. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 27. And I, do, I still do have a, a little bit of the sniffles this morning, but I am feeling um, better than I have in a month. So thank you all for your prayers. I did finally uh, give up my stubbornness and go to the doctor this week, and it helped. Who'd have thunk it? Yeah? All right. Mark 8, beginning in verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answer, answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this Plainly, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Chapter 8 is a pivotal chapter in the book of Mark. It, it is a chapter of transition. Um, in the earlier chapters, we have witnessed uh, Jesus demonstrating by word and deed that he is the Christ, he is the Son of God. He is able to do things that only God can do, such as forgive sins. Uh, he's able to, uh, in, in some of the things that he says, to be making very clear uh, claims of divinity uh, that he is one with god himself uh, his claims to divinity have been many and varied but in chapter eight jesus begins to speak plainly about his purpose uh, in a way that the disciples have not heard yet nor has anyone else in jesus's ministry he's been up until this time coming face to face with the religious elite and showing the the radical departures uh, that the gospel makes from religion uh, that there is a great divide between uh, man-made religion and gospel Christianity. But now he begins to talk about the purpose, the content, the meaning of Christianity and what it, what it is that can institute a new people of God. And in this text, he begins to speak, speak plainly about something uh, that beforehand, before now he's only made allusions to. He's only made allusions to, and the disciples, as dense as they seem to be sometimes, as dense as all of us seem to be, we don't catch a lot of those illusions. We need Jesus to speak plainly, and here, uh, in fact, he does. Uh, Jesus ultimately says here in chapter 8, I am a king indeed, but I am a king on his way to a cross, which absolutely shattered any c categories that they could have had about how to think about kingship and a kingdom. No king goes to a cross. They lead from a position of strength. And yet Jesus is demonstrating here that he's going to lead and institute his kingdom from a place of weakness. A, a place that is, uh, well, it's, it's scandalous, if you will. 
Because during that time, good people didn't hang around crosses. Good people weren't associated with crosses. Criminals were associated with crosses. People who were convicted of heinous crimes. But from this point forward, Christianity will forever be marked as the way of the cross. Even a hundred years later after Mark uh, is writing this letter, Nero would line the streets of Rome with burning Christians uh, on what? Crosses. So forever after this, the way of Christ and the way of the cross become synonymous. So Jesus is uh, unequivocally stating his right to rule, but his, his right to rule is purchased by the fact that he'll go to a cross. And so their paradigm is getting radically restructured, if you will. And so you see that uh, the, the collision of these two worldviews in Jesus' confrontation with Peter, who's just said, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. Another, uh, another gospel says, uh, he, he continues and says, the Christ, the Son of God. There is a real understanding to some degree of who Jesus is, and yet, They still don't get it. They get it, but they don't get it, if you can follow what I'm saying. The Jews were completely unified in their thinking that when Messiah comes, he will lead from a place of strength. He's going to come in, drive Rome out. He's going to reconstitute the nation of Israel in all of its former glory. He's going to bring back the days of David and Solomon. This is the king who would sit on the throne for all eternity. And he would restore uh, the people Israel back to their former glory. This is what all the people had understood from the Messiah. Even a chapter such as Isaiah chapter 53, which speaks of the suffering servant who's going to take on the sins of his people, that chapter in no Jewish literature has ever been associated with the Messiah up until this point. So they never, I mean, there, were, there was not even a strain of Jewish thinking that thought, oh yeah, the Messiah is going to be the one who suffers. Nobody, nobody, nobody saw it coming. And so they see him erasing Israel's position of servitude to foreign nations and restoring former glory. But they certainly don't see a cross. So in this passage of scripture, what we see Jesus doing is is bringing out who it is that people say he is, who the disciples understand him to be, and then providing an entirely new paradigm for how to think about the Messiah. Mark 8, 27, we'll now kind of just begin moving through verse by verse in the scripture here. Mark 8, 27, and he uh, was on his way with the disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. He asked them, who do people say that I am? Now, this was a time that had been ripe with messianic expectations. Up until now, Jesus has done and said some things that a lot of people are getting really, really excited about. But every opportunity that he would have to actually marshal the army, he wouldn't take that opportunity. Just a couple of chapters before here, Jesus fed 5,000 people. And what many commentators believe, these individuals were coming to Jesus because they understood him to be the Messiah, and they were coming to enlist. These weren't just folks wandering around wanting to hear Jesus teach. These were people who saw Here's the Messiah. The time is now. I want to be at the front of the line. And when Jesus had the opportunity to marshal this group as an army, instead he sent them away after he fed them. He never would give in to messianic expectations. John the Baptist just uh, a little while earlier has said, "One one is coming after me whom I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He's going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. And so, again, the expectations are here. John the Baptist is the one who was believed to be the forerunner of the Messianic figure. So Jesus has become the talk of every town for 100 miles, and he asks Who do they say that I am? But because Jesus hasn't been taking uh, those opportunities, because he didn't marshal the armies, some of the people are beginning to wonder if he is indeed the Messiah. And so they come up with answers like John the Baptist or one of the prophets. Maybe a a few months before, 
maybe at the feeding of the 5,000, maybe as that, that's, that's reading and that's coming on the scene, that that's what they're beginning to think about Jesus. But by this time, Jesus hasn't been taking these opportunities, and so he's a great figure indeed, but they're no longer calling him the Messiah. They're making him out to be someone great, but they're stopping short of calling him the Messiah. But Jesus is never really interested in what the masses think, is he? He's never really interested in what the masses think. Excuse me. He's far more interested in what his followers think. It's their ideas that have to be shaped and conformed to the truth. So, Mark eight twenty nine, he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, he's got the right answer, isn't he? Doesn't he? I mean, lots of times Peter's open his, opening his mouth and stupid stuff is falling out. Uh, well, this time he opens his mouth and, and expects an attaboy. Uh, he, he says, it, it, you're the Christ. You're the Son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the one that we're willing to follow, come what may. Although he just didn't understand what was coming at all, did he? Peter's uh, confession should be understood to represent the thinking of the twelve, not just himself. It's often kind of thought of Peter as the guy who really gets it, but, but the disciples don't at this point. No, all of the disciples are, are thinking the same thing. He's representative of the whole group at this point in time, but he's the only one to get vocal about it. So it seems that they get it, but not exactly. <clears throat> Mark chapter 8, verse 30 Jesus strictly charges them, don't tell anyone about me. Uh, in, in normal fashion, he says, keep this to yourselves. There's going to come a day when I'm going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, and I'm going to hear, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But that day is not yet. So keep quiet about these things. And then in Mark eight thirty one, he begins to teach them things that the disciples are going to greatly struggle with. Uh, they're, they're, he, like I said, he, he is absolutely blowing up their paradigm for how they've ever thought about the Messiah before. He strictly charges them to tell no one and then says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And verse, eight, uh, verse 32 says, and he said this plainly. He said, no more parables, no more cryptic allusions. Uh, Jesus says this very, very plainly. I must suffer. I must be rejected by the religious elite, the people who should be receiving me. I'm going to be rejected by them. I must be killed. I must rise again. In what should have been a, been a, a plain but inconceivable or i'm sorry in what would have been a plain but inconceivable revelation jesus shatters their messianic hopes now imagine these are adults who have been taught from the age of children i mean they're sitting around the, the fire with their parents at night and they're hearing these stories but one day the messiah is going to come one day he's going to write everything that's wrong one day he's going to drive the romans out one day we're going to return to this place of glory one day it's going to be fantastic and when he shows up it's going to be a glorious thing this is what they've heard since the time they were young children and now jesus is saying I, i've i've got to go die we're pretty hard on Peter sometimes, right? For some of the things that he says, some of the things that he does. And we can be hard on him here. How is it, Peter, that you can't understand? How is it, Peter, that you can't just sit quietly and listen to this? I think in this story, I'm Peter. I don't think I could have been the guys just hanging at the back of the room and, and not talking about this. He agrees with their confession of who he is but then he says, I'm not the Messiah you expected. I'm not the Messiah you expected. Verse 32, and Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. Another gospel records Peter saying, this shall never happen to you, Lord. The word for rebuke here is a very, very strong word. It's the same word that's used whenever Jesus is shutting demons up. 
Jesus would rebuke demons, the same Greek word for rebuke. There are several words in that word group that Jesus could have used that are, uh, or that the, the inspired writer could have used that are uh, less forceful. But he uses the one to say that Peter took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him. He, be- he took Jesus aside to say, Jesus, you, you've got things all wrong here. You don't understand it. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you need, to, you need a nap, Jesus. You're mistaking who it is that you are and what it is that you shall do. This will never happen to you. They understood the Messiah to be the one who could establish correct order. To put right what was wrong. But the problem is that Peter and the rest of the disciples have a poor view of what's really wrong. Their view of what's wrong is viewed in nationalistic ideas. What's wrong is Rome's here. What's wrong is we don't have the right to rule and worship and live the way that we want to. That's what's wrong. And Jesus is ultimately saying something, something far deeper, something far more systemic, something far deeper rooted is the problem here, which is that, what, which is that to, to necessita- necessitate Christ's death. It's going to necessitate the fact that Jesus must suffer. He must die. He must be rejected. And of course, he must rise again. The problem was not political, ethnic, or national. The problem was sin. That's what the problem has always been since Genesis chapter 3. The problem was sin. You see, sin will then have multiple and varied effects. And the disciples are confusing the effects of sin with the root of the problem itself. Sin is always the major problem. It brought death into the world. It then gives way to these effects of sin, but sin at its root is the problem. We can't confuse the effects with the cause. We can't confuse the symptoms with the sickness. Jesus has a clear understanding of the real problem. He always does. And he has a clear understanding of how to solve the problem. The disciples, as I said, have confused an effect of sin, which is Roman occupation, with the real problem, sin itself. Sin as personal rebellion separating us from God wasn't on Peter's radar. That's not what he was thinking about. When he thinks about what's wrong with the world, the first answer out of their mouth had to be Rome. (laughs) That's what's wrong with the world. They're here, and they shouldn't be. Their first answer wasn't that I have sinned and rebelled against a holy God, and because of that, I've been separated through that sin. So they didn't understand sin this way, or at least it wasn't a major focus for them. But it is what Jesus came to deal with. Remember, Jesus came preaching, Mark chapter 1. Repent. And believe the gospel. He's preaching to masses of people composed of individuals who need to repent of their personal transgressions against God. And then turn to God again in faith. Repent and believe the gospel. But to this point, the disciples have framed the gospel in nationalistic ideas. They've got it all Confused, And so Peter rebukes Jesus strongly because Jesus doesn't, under, doesn't seem to understand the gospel. Not so far as Peter and the disciples understand it, as the gospel is, the good news is the Messiah is going to drive Rome out. He's going to return us to former glory. And so he's confronting and rebuking Jesus because of this. Sin, personal sin, and separation from God has become in their minds, functionally at least, a small problem. And it's a small problem easily solved. The sacrificial system in their minds was designed to solve the sin problem. We kill a bull, we kill a goat, we shed its blood, and sin is atoned for. They had some idea how the forgiveness of God works in relationship to God's justice. And we have some idea of it. We know that, uh, that, that sin has to be taken care of in, in some way or another. Sin creates a debt. A just God can't look 
uh, at sinful people and simply let them go free, willy-nilly for- forgiving them as if it's not a big deal. Sin creates a very real debt that has to be paid. And the disciples understand that. The sacrificial system taught them that. But they drastically underestimated the amount of the debt that had accrued. They drastically underestimated this. The sacrificial system where goats and bulls are killed could never provide a satisfactory way to pay this debt. This is why the writer of Hebrews would say just that. The blood of goats and bulls could never atone for sins. Now, it did provide a framework of meaning, but not the substance, not the content of that meaning. The framework of meaning established that sin must be punished by death, that debt was only payable in the form of blood, a life taken. That they understood. The debt created, however, was enormous, and it would take a divine figure of infinite worth who would share the nature of humanity to pay the debt of sin. Now, the apostles who would write the books of the New Testament would have their minds so radically changed from this point on through the end of Jesus' ministry, uh, ultimately up to the cross, so that they would then write epistles under, uh, with full understanding of what it is that Jesus had accomplished on the cross of Calvary. You see, Peter would know later, Jesus must suffer. He would know later, Jesus must die. He must be rejected. He must be raised again. They would understand all of these things and would write about them in their epistles later, but right now they're still pretty confused. Mark 8.33, But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. So, Peter pulls Jesus aside, begins to speak very, very strongly to him. Jesus, the You're tired, you're confused, whatever. But Jesus pulls him aside and begins to rebuke Peter strongly, saying, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The things of God were redemption, reconciliation through propitiation, the ransom of all believing sinners through the death of Jesus. This was, uh, these were the things of God. This is what God had his mind set on. But the things of man were national freedom, vengeance on the Romans, the return to national and ethnic glory, to put the Jews in a place of prominence again, to give them honor again, to renew a Jewish sense of self. To renew a Jewish sense of worth. We are the chosen people of God, they thought. And it is absolutely inconsistent and wrong for us to be living in this kind of servitude. Messiah will come and he will restore all of this. And Jesus says, these things that you have your mind set on, they're the things of man. Peter wanted Jesus to restore all of this through his messianic reign. All of the rest of the disciples wanted the same thing. And suffering wasn't part of the deal. It just didn't make sense at all to them. Have you ever wondered why it was that Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. A little harsh, right? I mean, come on, Jesus. They've learned this since children. Aren't you being a little harsh? Well, think about it. What had Satan offered Jesus at the end of his 40-day fast? Satan offered Jesus a kingdom without a cross. Satan said, bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. I'll make your name greater than, than everything. Peter or, or, or Satan had promised all of these things to Jesus. Jesus, you can have all of this. and You can forget the cross. You can have all of this, and you can forget suffering. Peter, at this moment, is mouthing the agenda of Satan. Jesus, you're going to reign. You're going to rule. Absolutely, we know it. You're going to uh, give us back what we long for. All of this is going to happen. 
But the cross doesn't fit into that. And so, Peter is mouthing the (laughs) agenda of Satan. He's offering what Satan offered. Power, significance, and security through hook or by crook, but not by self-effacing sacrifice. Not through a cross. Jesus is redefining who Messiah is and what he will do. And we have to try to cut the we have to try to cut the disciples a break here. I think we would have done the same thing. I think we would have done the same thing, especially here in our country. I mean, we're we're taught to run away from suffering at all costs, aren't we? It seems like an older generation seem to understand suffering and to understand that character and integrity and so many good things are built through hardship and affliction. But in today's era, we want to counsel people to run from suffering at all costs. I think we would have been right there with the disciples. I think we would have been right there saying the same things that they said. Now Jesus turns from messianic suffering to the hardship of those who would follow him. And I think this is one of the reasons. I think, I think, Paul, I think, or, uh, I think Peter understood to some degree that if Messiah is going to suffer then his followers would suffer. And I think that was part of what was so repugnant to him. I mean, they're signing up for glory, not a cross. They're signing up for the restoration of nationalistic hopes, not suffering. So in chapter 8, verse 34, it says, And Jesus, and calling to the crowd, uh, I'm sorry, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus has just spent the the few previous verses explaining who Messiah is and what it is that he will come to do. And he immediately turns from what Messiah will do to what his followers must do. He goes from telling his story to telling their story, and it's not pretty. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And and remember again, the the whole idea of cross is scandalous to them. The mention of the word itself is scandalous to them. Now if we stopped here and tried to understand what Jesus was saying, I I think our understanding would be ill-formed. I've preached this verse before, and to be quite honest with you, uh, in... uh, through my study this week, I came to believe that I've preached it wrong um, many times in the past. So we can't stop with that verse. We have to see Jesus uh, uh, fleshing out the next few verses to help us understand what it is to deny oneself, what it is to take up a cross and follow Jesus. Verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it, But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So I want us to take a, a few concepts out of these verses and examine them. First in verse 34, the concept of denying self concept of denying self in verse 35 the concept of one's life and verses 36 and 37 the concept of one's soul whatever jesus is saying here it cannot be construed so narrowly as to mean the denial of simple fleshly desires which is the way i've often thought about it and the way i've often taught it in order to follow jesus we have to say no to the things we want to do you know, basically some kind of sanctified version of that. Um, is that a siren? So whatever it means, it can't be construed that narrowly. The words used here are far too strong for that. The word for self is simple enough in verse 34. In fact, it's the word for himself, deny himself. It's a simple pronoun uh, in the Greek. Life, though, in verse 35, really starts to cue us into something. 
I think it's deliberately chosen because several words could be chosen from the Greek for the word life. But the word life is chosen here, which is the Greek word psyche. Psyche, from where we get our word psychology and other words uh, in that group. Lastly, soul is considered to be the essential self. The essential self, the true self, the thing we believe to be the most important of all. This is the defining characteristic of, uh, of humanity, that we have been created with souls. This is the irreducible self. Well, the word for life is the most instructive for us and it, because it refers to identity, personhood, or selfhood. This refers to the way a person evaluates their meaning, the way they evaluate their worth. In this world, we find our meaning in the people we know, the things we have accomplished, where we come from, the education that we have, how much money we have, the family we were born into. We could go on and on and on about the ways we find meaning. And whenever Jesus talks about here, about trading uh, one's life in for something greater, here he, this is what he's speaking about. This idea of personhood, this idea of worth, this idea of intrinsic value. And all of us want to feel that we are valuable. All of us want to feel that we are significant. Peter rebukes Jesus because... Peter sees the value and worth and significance of the Jewish people tied up in moving Rome out and giving them back their former glory. That's how he's understanding personhood. That's how he's understanding his sense of identity, his sense of worth. And, Peter, and when Jesus starts talking about going to a cross, that confuses Peter, wait a minute. So there are all kinds of things that we greatly value because they tend to give us meaning. They bolster our personal sense of self. So when Jesus says, if you want to follow Messiah, the king who will go, um, I'm sorry, if you want to follow Messiah, the king who will go to a cross and suffer, then you must deny your sense of self. He's not talking about just the pleasurable things you'd like to do that keep you from doing God's work which is an easy way to see this verse. But if we read it in context, Jesus is talking about something far bigger, far deeper than all of that. You must deny your sense of self. The things that you, the way, you, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the ways you understand personhood. The ways you understand your sense of value. Your sense of self. You have to reject all the things that you've considered most important about yourself if you hold on to your sense of self by way of prizing your achievements clinging to your heritage tight fisting your money whatever it is if you cling to these things then those are the things that are defining how you value yourself the things that we hold on tightest to in this life are the things that tell the most about us if you are incredibly stingy with your money and you cannot be generous and give to others then it demonstrates that one of the ways that you value yourself the way you understand your sense of identity is because of the money you have be it little or much you hang on tight but if you if you hold on to your sense of self in these ways you'll lose your true self in it all What's Jesus saying here about this idea of soul? If you gain the whole world, you think, you think so much of yourself, you think you're important, you think you're significant, you've made valuable contributions, you're an important person. If you gain that sense of self and yet lose your soul, what have you profited in all of that? If you gain the world but lose your true self, what have you profited? So Jesus is here resetting the way that people think. He's always doing this, isn't he? He's always doing this. Jesus said in Luke that prostitutes are closer to heaven than Pharisees. He said that prostitutes are closer to heaven than the Pharisees were. 
This enraged the Pharisees, didn't it? The Pharisees had a strong, self-righteous sense of self. Their sense of worth was high because of their spiritual and religious accomplishments. They are important people. They have made significant contributions. And Jesus says the prostitutes are closer to heaven than you are because the prostitute has a very low sense of self because she can't stand herself. She's the one who can more easily get over her sense of worth and identity and cling to a new sense of identity than the Pharisees could. Paul understood this well, too. For when, he came, or for when uh, Jesus came to him, he was in the place of the Pharisee. In Philippians, he remembers counting all his sense of self as loss in order that he might gain something far greater. Philippians 3, 8. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. He's just listed this long list of things that he was known for. He was an accomplished individual. He was significant. He was important. He was well thought of. He was revered. He was feared. This was a very important man who should have had a high sense of self and personhood based on the things he'd accomplished and the things that he'd done. And he says, I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. He denied self and clung to the cross. Paul understands that he's making a trade here. He's trading in in all that people think is important for something better. I count it all loss so that I can gain Christ. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's resetting values. He's resetting the way we understand identity and personhood. He's saying you're going to have to deny your sense of self, deny all of the things that are important to you, deny all of the ways that that you thought you mattered and you're significant, and you're going to have to cling to something that's scandalous in order to receive receive a new identity, a new personhood, a new sense of self. So he says, set aside the things that you valued so much so that you can find your true self, the lesser for the greater. Let me ask you, what is it that is critically important to you? What is it that is critically important to you? What are the things that you hold so tight to the vest? Are you so concerned about what people think about you and that you you preserve this sense of this image Is that something that's absolutely critical to you? What is it that you're holding so tightly? Maybe it's people you know and you love the fact that you know the right people and because of your associations with people in places of significant power, then you feel like you're more of an individual because of that. Maybe it's your education. You're a really smart guy. You've been educated uh, uh, well and, and so because of that, that's, that's, a, that's a sense of uh, importance and a sense of significance for you. Maybe it's your work ethic. You're, you're a hard worker and you just get after it. And that's the way you identify and understand your sense of self. Whatever it is that you're holding so close to, so tightly to, whatever it is that's so important to you, so significant about you, let me tell you what that is. That is your Righteousness. That is, that thing, or that collection of things, that's your righteousness. That's the thing that you hold on to because you think it's the most important thing about who you are. And Jesus says, let it go. You can't let people know you. You're scared what they would think if they did. You hold on and you elevate yourself because of your work ethic. So you talk about those who are lazy or this or that or whatever. And you're so judgmental about other people. Because whatever the thing is that you hold on to, it's also the thing that you use to most severely judge other people. What are you holding on to? That's your righteousness. It's what makes you special, important, significant. And Paul says, 
I count it all as loss. It's nothing. It's worthless. It's certainly not eternal. You have to let it go. You have to let it go because it's rubbish. You have to let it go because it's worthless in comparison to the eternal weight of glory found only at one place, the cross. This is why Jesus could say here in verse 34, deny himself, cling to a cross. Cling to the thing that, that looks most heinous. Cling to the thing that, that looks most painful because in that, that's where you're going to find your true sense of self. And what is that place? It's the place where Jesus gave himself up for you. This isn't a cross like we just wear on a necklace and we have some idea or some, some nebulous sense of suffering or hardship. This is Jesus bleeding out on the cross of Calvary to reconstitute your person. To make you brand new. What else does it mean when, when Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man is in Christ, old things have passed away. Those individuals have let go of their sense of self, their sense of personhood. They've let go of all of the things that seem so important and so significant to them. They've let go of all those old things, and all things have become new. They've become new in Christ. So whatever it is that gives you that sense of identity, these are the things that have to be denied if you're going to be a follower of Jesus and find your true self in him. Jesus' way is the way of the cross. It's where you find an identity that he set for you. Jesus is the one who gets to tell you who you are. He's the one who tells us who Messiah is. He's the one who tells us what the way of the Messiah is like and, and what he must do in order to reconcile us to God. He's the one who gets to tell us that. He's also the one who gets to tell us who we are. This past week, I had, I had a real moment of, uh, of self-pain. In the sense that all of the ways that I can fall back into in thinking about myself, my significance, my worth, my value, I'd kind of fallen back into that for just a moment in, in really, in, in fear. And I heard the enemy say to me things like, you're not the guy for this. You can't do it. Look at your measly list of accomplishments you're going to get found out as a fraud. You will fail radically. Everyone will laugh at you. It will all fall to pieces. And you know what I said right then? It, it just, every once in a while, you know, uh, um, we, we get it right. And this was one of those times where everyone, I, 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 I stumbled on that, that pearl of great price at that moment, and I said, Jesus, will you tell me who I am? Will you tell me who I am? And he told me, he told me that I was of infinite worth to him. That he came to allow his body to be broken and his blood spilled out all over the ground to remake me, to bring beauty out of ashes. And so Jesus began to tell me who I was, and I just began to feel the Holy Spirit of God just preaching the gospel to me in that moment. And so I began to rehearse the truth of the gospel and just kind of live in that and then remember that I'm a victorious conqueror in Jesus Christ who absolutely cannot be defeated, shut up, backed up, or, or, or stomped down. That's who I am in Jesus Christ. When Jesus says, take up your cross, he's telling you to be identified through his work, not yours. This is, 30, verse 34, which sounds like such a very, uh, such a daunting kind of thing. Ooh, self-denial and 
taking up a cross. And it's really, it's really a beautiful declaration of the gospel. You've got to turn away from all of the things that, the ways that you value yourself and the things that you think are significant about yourself, your righteousness, which is as filthy rags before God. You've got to deny all of that stuff and you've got to cling to the cross because Jesus did what was necessary to put you right with God. Jesus has reconstituted your person through his work. He's telling us to be done with all the illusions that this world offers. If I could get more money, if I could get that better position in my job, if I could get more authority, if I could have more say in the way things go around here. And Jesus is saying, be done with all of those things. We receive our new identity by nature of the violence done to Jesus on the cross. So that's why we have to embrace it. That's why we embrace the cross. Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection reinstituted the meaning of humanity. No one else could ever do it. No one else could ever reconstitute humanity according to God's original intentions for it. Only God could write himself into the story. Write himself into humanity. Yet without a sin nature. So as to save us from judgment on it. Because if we cling to our sense of self. All of that is going to be judged and it will burn. That's all filthy rags. Jesus is saying, deny your former attempts at making meaning for yourself and surrender to my life, my death, and my resurrection as that which establishes eternal meaning for your life. Embrace the cross. Embrace the cross. When you see this, When you see this, when you get this, when you learn to rest in this truth, when Jesus is the one who tells you who you are and you listen to the beautiful cadence of his voice as he speaks to you, the truth of who you are, when you see this, then you embrace the cross and you follow him. Then you're able to do things, hard things, then you're able to enter that narrow way that uh, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14 talks about the narrow way and the wide way. And the narrow way, an interesting thing about it is, is the word for narrow is a word that means affliction. But when we see what Jesus did at the cross, then embracing that way, that way of affliction... It's not so hard anymore. It's not so hard anymore because he's told us who we are. Peter was so freaked out by what Jesus said because he didn't understand that his true self was in desperate need of being remade. Suffering didn't make sense because he didn't realize how desperate the situation was. We stand on this side of the cross. And we need to be reminded continually of the desperate nature of our sin problem and what Jesus did to solve it. Peter didn't get it then, but later, once Peter could see what, what it was that Jesus had done, he could say this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you may follow in his steps. Let's pray.